1 Corinthians 2, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. 1 Corinthians 2, the Bible says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring you unto the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which, not, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of, of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither any entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them unto us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And what man knoweth the things of man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we, re, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, and that we might know the things which are freely given of us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things unto spiritual. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for the group this morning that is met to glorify and honor your name. Lord, we pray that you would uh, be lifted up in the services. Lord, we uh, pray for Brother Ken this morning that you would touch his body and that you would heal him uh, according to your mercy and grace. Lord, meet with us if it be your will, and we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now we'll be preaching this morning on the teaching of the Spirit. Now a lot of Baptists kind of want to avoid this, but if we are to learn this word, it must be learned by the Spirit. This is not a dictionary. This is not uh, a novel. It is the very living Word of God, and it's only living to them that are alive by the Spirit, that are alive to the Spirit. And, and on top of that, even for those that have been spiritually born again, it's only, it's only healing and only speaking when you're in the will of God. Uh, uh, I've read it and uh, got more out of Laura Ingalls Wilder than I did out of that if I weren't in the Spirit. You remember uh, as John was getting the revelation, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And you know what? If, if John made note that he was in the Spirit, there's certainly a time that we can be out of the Spirit. Amen. I'm not saying lost again, but I'm saying not in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. And, and you know, Pentecostals have almost taken that away with us, from us, but it is essential if you're going to learn the Word of God or even learn your own spiritual situation, it comes by the Spirit and none other. And, and so we see that as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and Corinth had a lot of problems, it had a lot of difficulties, and there was a lot of sin in the church. You know, as I travel to preach these days, I see a lot of sin in the Lord's churches. Now, everybody gets down at Corinth, which I think Rome, I think Rome was in worse shape than Corinth. That's just my own opinion. But if you read the, if you read that letter, I think you'd have to agree with me. But every problem, I mean, every church that the, uh, Paul wrote to had issues. And you know what? I don't know of any church that don't have issues. Mm -hmm. And if it, and, and you know why? 
They're not made out of perfect people. Every one of us have this flesh and bone to deal with on a daily basis. And if not, we'd be in home of glory. So churches have problems, and church, the church of Corinth did too. Now, we'll see he begins to correct them uh, on some things that were not in line with the truth of the Word of God. And he begins about ministry. You know what I have seen with the Joe Osteens and, and stuff like that is that it hinders real ministry. Uh, it, it gives a piece of sarcasm to the truth of the Word of God. Uh, these people that are health and wealth teachers, you know, what they really do is hinder the real ministry of Christ. And, and in so doing, the, de the devil uses them in an unbelievable way, and many people stand in ignorance. And I, brethren, addressing redeemed folks, and I, brethren, came to you, uh, came, uh, came not, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring you uh, the testimony of God. Now, why, why is this noteworthy, and why is it important? There's nothing wrong with an education, but don't let the education speak for you. Uh, you know, I, I've said this before, I learned more my first three months out of nursing school as far as how to get the things done than I did in the four years previous, because it was experiential. It, it was something that I was doing every day. And, and very similarly, you can read that book to cover to cover, and if God's not in it, you know what? You've wasted your time. Uh, what we need is the Holy Ghost as an instructor of the things of God. What did truth such as predestination and election get lost? I'll tell you why, because they weren't conveyed through the Holy Ghost. And so we as the Lord's people, we... We need to understand it and, and look at the Word of God in terms that Paul did. Now, another reason he made that noteworthy is because he was a very intelligent man. He was a very smart man. Uh, Paul, it is estimated that he spoke five languages fluently. And, and he was, so when he came, it wasn't because he wasn't smart, but he wanted the gospel to be simplistic. He wanted the gospel that those heathen Greeks could even understand the simplistic truth of the word of God. And God will bless that time and time again. So we as the Lord's people, I think uh, what would be meaningful for us this morning is do you understand the difference between being taught of the Holy Ghost and being taught of man. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge difference. You know how you learn your laws through the Holy Ghost? Right. Uh, you know what? Without that lesson, you think you're okay. Without that lesson, you think you're doing pretty good. Yeah. But when that comes as truth, yeah. then you really begin to see how needful you really are. Yeah. And, and, and so we find that as Paul is writing, it wasn't because he was an ignorant man, but he wanted the gospel to be preached in, uh, in simplicity. You know how, save, how salvation comes? It comes from the goodness and grace of God. Do you, learn, you know how you learn how vile you are? From the goodness and grace of God. And do you know how you learn the remedy of sin? By the goodness and grace of God. Amen. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Amen. Those are spiritually discerned. And, and we live in a day and age where I think uh, almost those have been replaced by things that we can learn up here. So Paul made it specific. I didn't, I didn't come that way. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know what? What a simplistic message this morning. If we could get out the truth that the remedy for sin is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, you know what the problem of our president, what the remedy could be? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know what the remedy for the most vile person you know? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's Amen. all we need. Amen. He poured Himself out for you, sinner Amen. friend, and that's all you need. I don't need to be baptized. I don't need to join a church. 
I need, I need Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm -hmm. You know, all those other things can come later. We need to preach right. the gospel. Uh, and so we find uh, that Paul makes it very specific that he came sh sharing a very simplistic gospel. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness. Now, uh, uh, Brother Eric, my brother-in-law, one day, more than once, and one day when he's working on his house, I think it's when he bought Miss Virginia's little house. And he said, you know what, Larry, I wouldn't be a preacher for nothing. And I was like, well, Eric. And uh, he says, well, look at you. He says, you're always sick. <laughs> and he says, uh, and, and he says, uh, he may come in, and it's true, our, our house is always having issues. And it was really having issues back then. He goes, I wouldn't do it for anything. And uh, you know what? That's kind of what Paul was saying. I was with you in weakness. He was mostly blind. He, th there was difficulty there. You know what? Uh, someone that's in eloquent of speech, they certainly can be used for the Lord, but uh, the one that really can be used is the one that stands in ignorance. The one, the one that has difficulty learning, the, the individual that's crippled and, and can w not walk of himself, those demure things Christ used to honor himself. And that's what he, that, that's what he was saying here. I, I, I came with a simplistic go gospel. I came with the hindrances of weakness in the flesh and in fear. Now, um, there have been very few times that I've preached in my in my life, maybe once or twice, that I was fearful. Uh, a couple of times preaching on the street corner, and another time I'm not going to say, but I was actually preaching at church, and I was like, I don't know if any kids are going to get out of here or not. And that, um, he said, I was with you that way. Uh, you know, Corinth was a Greek society, and they had numerous, numerous gods, and they were very protective of them. And for Paul to say, that stone means nothing. It has no power. It, ha it has no source in of itself. It's a rock. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, that pretty stuff for a hard stuff for the Greek to take down. Right. And, and, and so he, 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 he was very uh, fearful, no doubt, even of his life in the day in which he lived. So he said, I was weak. I was afraid. And then he says, and much trembling. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not in, with enticing words of man's wisdom. Now I certainly enjoy commentaries and I, I enjoy reading the, uh, what other men may have thought about a passage of scripture. But the best information you can get is laying in your lap. Enticing words of man. You know, that's fine. And, uh, you know, uh, Spurgeon, he was a great man, definitely gifted of God. But his words are not inspired. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, we, uh, we must be cautious of what we take as divinely inspired and what is not. And so he says, I, I came very simplistically to you. And this, the end of verse 4 is what we need. But in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You know, more than anything else, what I desire the remaining years of my ministry to be is in the demonstration of the Spirit. When the Spirit shows up and says, Hey, this Word is a lot more than empty words on a page. This is significant. This comes from God. And if you do that, when, you, when they roll you out here beside the church building, uh, you can say I did the best I could. He said, that's what I wanted. Very intelligent man. Uh, knew Hebrew and Greek backwards and forward. He says, this is what I determined. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And, 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 and we need to be more and more like that, especially when preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this is what I did. And then in verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. And again, he was saying, I could have done that, 
but I chose not to. I, I couldn't give you all the history uh, of everything that goes with it, but I preach to you Jesus Christ and Him crucified, but in the power of God. Now, uh, Brother Jackson there, I know uh, you've preached long enough. You've preached when God was there and when God wasn't. You preached where uh, you were being, being used of God and when you weren't. And, and there's, a very, there's a very realistic difference. And what we need is for God to show up. And in the days which we live, how else would He show up? Where's the Lord Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures? It's at the right hand of the Father, is He not? Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the living element here and now? It's the Holy Ghost, right? right. The most ignored mm -hmm. person of the Godhead. And you know why? Because uh, the, the Pentecostals think that they got a one man's market on that truth. You know what? The Holy Ghost is just as real as Jehovah God Himself. And we live in a day and age where he's largely ignored. Uh, uh, you know, he's the best teacher you'll ever have. He, he, he's, the most, uh, he's the most knowledgeable of that book than, than any man-made person. And so we find, we find that Paul claimed that. And he says, that is your best teacher. Verse 6. Howbeit, howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now, I know a lot of people would jump on that as sinless perfection. But what it really is, is complete. I speak that unto them that are com complete. Lost person, you know what you are this morning? You're incomplete. You're not finished. You're, you're not a real person. You're not a whole individual because you lack the person of the Holy Spirit. He says, now what I'm fixing to tell you, it's applicable to the redeemed. It is applicable to those that are saved. So you know what? That, that says this to me. You're not going to learn a lot about that book without, about being genuinely saved. In fact, I'll go this far. You won't learn anything about it. And, and except maybe huh, numbers and words. And so Paul says, uh, this is for those that are complete. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes or the authority of this world that come to naught. So who were the princes when he's addressing a, the Corinthian people? They were the Romans. They, they were the they were the Gentiles of that day. And he says, listen, your authority means nothing. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the, uh, before the world unto our glory. Now, if you don't get anything out, out of this but this, remember this, there's hidden wisdom. And that hidden wisdom is revealed by the Holy Ghost. That hidden wisdom, what makes that word rich and full and good and encouraging to the people of God, that is revealed, that wisdom is revealed by the Holy Ghost. You ever wondered what the difference between knowledge and wisdom was? Well, I can, I can tell you, and I've studied that for years. Knowledge is just facts. Like, this country declared its independence July the 4th, 1776. That's a fact. That's knowledge. But wisdom is being able to make it applicable. You know, you know what they did after they made that declaration? It would have meant nothing, but they declared war on the greatest nation in the world. They, they backed it up. That, that's wisdom. So one thing that true redemption gives you is the ability to make this word applicable to the daily life. It, it, it helps you apply it to the truths that are around it. Uh, verse uh, 
verse 8. And none of the princes of this world knew. In other words, they're ignorant of it. They don't understand it. They don't know it in a spiritual way, which none of the princes of the, this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, listen, now he's addressing the Jewish people. You know what? A lot of people say, well, the Roman took his life. No, the Roman tried to deliver him, and the Jews wouldn't let him. Did they, did they perform the crucifixion? Uh, the Romans did, but at whose authority? Uh, Caiaphas himself said to crucify him. Uh, get rid of him. End his life. And, and so we find they did sin very much in ignorance. Verse 9. But is it written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, I ask you this morning, how much do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? How much do you love uh, the whole person of the Godhead? How much do you love the Holy Spirit? How much are you thrilled when he comes by your way? What do you feel of him? You know, uh, you ever try to sit and contemplate what a wonderful time that's going to be? You know, I can't even get a hold of the fact when this flesh has got not got to be dealt with anymore. I really can't. Uh, because you know why? All I've ever known was dealing with it. For the redeemed, we can't even comprehend what's ahead of us. How good and gracious. How, how wonderful. And, and I do like to sit and contemplate on it, but I know most of what I see is nothing more than man's ideas but what a wonderful thing for the redeemed what's ahead. Notice verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. You, you know how you get a little glimpse of glory every now and again? By the spirit. You don't get it by reading empty words on a page. You, you, know, you, ever, you know, just for a moment, oh, how wonderful it would be to sit at the feet of Jesus and get just a tiny glimpse of it. And you know what? When I do that, it's enough to go on for a long time. It, it, it's, enough to do, it, it's enough to encourage me uh, for the days ahead. And he's saying, huh, you, don't even, you don't even understand it. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So how do you learn about this word that lays before us this morning? How, how do you dig into the rich truths? How do you get into the things uh, that nurture you along the way? There, it is an impossibility if the Spirit don't show up. You know, have you ever gone uh, into a church and be dry as a cracker or, or dry, uh, dry as Arizona in the middle of summer? I have. And, and you know what? The only thing I can come to is the Spirit's not. It's just not present. Yeah. We, we, we need that. And you know, uh, more than anything else in 2021, what we need is to God to show up in a few service, services and teach us some things from this book. And he, that's exactly what he said here. You can't learn it without the Spirit. Verse 12. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. Yes. So how else are you going to learn it? How else are you going to know it? How else is this going to be real to you without the spirit of God? Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now that's the problem with you, Joel Osteen's and all that crew today. They're not uh, comparing spiritual unto spiritual. You know what? When they say, oh, you're going to be rich the rest of your life, what does wealth have to do with it? Well, I can tell you this. The wealth has to do with the here and now. I preached probably a hundred funerals in my lifetime. And you know what? The banker's card didn't roll up to the grave. All that was left was that man's empty vessel. And that's all that will be left of you too. So do you know 
things by the Spirit. Why do people get so caught up on money? I can tell you why. Two things. First of all, the flesh. No. And the second thing, they're not being called of the Spirit. You know when you learn how, how really insignificant money is? When you're in the Spirit. You know, uh, money's fine to get some food on your table. But one, one signature by our president, and that money you have in your account is worthless. Ever think about that? That puts us dependent on God, does it not? That, that puts us dependent on God on the, on the next meal that He is pleased to place on our table. And so we find if we're going to learn of God, if we're going to understand the, what, the ways of God, it has to be by the Spirit. Now, um, uh, Acts chapter 16, Acts 16, and I want to uh, read about the real deal. I, I want to read to you about something that goes far more than uh, just facts that this wonderful book teaches us. Acts 16 and verse 30. Acts 16 and verse 30, the Bible says this, and brought them out, meaning uh, the Philippian jailer, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must do I to be saved? You know what a wonderful, glorious thing when you come down to the point of saying, what do I need to do to be saved? Because you know what? That's not a natural desire of man in any form or fashion. Right. Yeah. What a wonderful thing when I certainly knew I was lost. And I didn't want to stay in that condition. You know, even realizing you're lost and you're okay with it, that, that, that's not spiritually discerned. But when you realize, when, when He opens your heart to the fact you're lost, you know what? When God does that, you desire a remedy. You desire, you desire a solution. And, and, and so we find then that as uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, as the Philippian jailer approached Paul and Silas, this was his, under, this was his desire. Notice what he said, and they, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, what a glorious and glorious thing. And you know what? He didn't start with, well, uh, first of all, you have to be uh, elected in eternity past. Then the Holy Ghost has to show up, and then somebody's got to share the gospel with you. And no, no, all that is certainly a true fact. But he said, you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Yeah. What a glorious, wonderful truth, isn't it? How much about election and divine and, and the sovereignty of God did you know about when the Lord saved you? And, I'll have, and I'm just saying for me, nothing. I knew nothing, really even about the nature of God except that He was holy and I wasn't. That about summed it up. But you know what? <laughs> Very simplistic gospel that they fed, that they shared with the Philippian jailer. Verse thirty-two, and they spake unto him uh, the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And the reason I point that out is because a lot of people will use these verses to uh, promote baptismal regeneration because all his house is mentioned. But I want you to see in the verse that we just read, all his house heard the gospel too. Presbyterian folks try to uh, throw this in here for uh, for uh, infant baptism. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't say he had any little bitty ones, does it? I don't think he did. In fact, I'll go further. I know he didn't. Because <laughs> that would suggest infant baptism. So it says, all his house heard the gospel, all his house was saved, and all of them were baptized. What, what, what a wonderful, glorious truth. The simplistic gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it opened his heart completely. Notice what it says. And they took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, meaning the apostles and where they had been beaten, and was baptized, meaning the Philippian jailer's family, he and all his straightway. 
Now, I'll, I'll throw this in and we'll move on. I want you to see he heard the gospel. The Lord opened his heart and he was saved and then he was baptized. I will say this, and this gives you something to think about this week and chew on. I think sometimes we wait a little too long. Uh, there, there's nothing in the scriptures to say give it time. Uh, there's nothing in the scriptures to say wait and see if it sticks. Just immediately. You know, I baptized at some strange times of the day, but I've never baptized anybody at all. And, and, and so we find we find that salvation presented and in simplicity the Lord used and he saved these folks. Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 and verse 25. Luke 24 and verse 25. The Bible says this. And then he, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and, and then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaking. And, and if you know your Bible, it says that he manifested himself in a different form. You know, it's amazing to me to try to get a hold of He could take on any form he wanted to. He looked different. He presented different. And they were walking along to that road. And they didn't even recognize him. And he, and he, he said, oh, you're so slow of heart. You ever think about how slow of heart that you are? You know, back in the old days, uh, when I was young, uh, somebody had a little, li little bit of a learning difference. They said they were slow. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that. I think that we needed to figure out how they learned. But at any rate, that's what they said. And you know, that's what the Lord Jesus was saying. You are so slow. You're not getting this. And, and you know what? The reason is, is sin. And what hinders us learning truth is sin. Always. And so he said, you're slow of heart. You're, <clears throat> you're, you're not getting this. You're not understanding this. Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh into the village, whither they went. And he made though as he would have gone further. But they constrained him and said, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went to tarry with them. And it came to pass... He, uh, as he said it me and with them he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them and their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight you know what what glorious wonderful day when your eyes are opened see that's not a work of man is it uh, even today when I get a good look at myself I'm appalled uh, I, I'm disgusted at myself but you know what? Uh, that, that, that's the reality of mankind. Yeah. Uh, you know what? You know why I like to see myself? Often I, I'm, I'm sickened when I see myself good, but it sure makes me want to serve him more. Then if you know the rest of this, it said, did our hearts not burn within us? See, when you're convinced of the Holy Ghost, it's a whole lot different than reading words on a page, isn't it? You, want, you know what made them understand who Christ was? Because it burned within them. Now, I will get you to look at what, what was he doing? He was expanding the Word of God. He said that he began all the way back to the books of Moses and, and, and showed in battle that he was the very Christ, the Son of the living God. And then what made the difference? It burned the them. You know, the burning power of the Word of God will teach you about sin, and it'll teach you of good things to come. It'll teach you about your nature, and it'll teach you about the nature of the Almighty. That's the goodness of the Word of God. Last place in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 22. I chose these verses because it shows really that the way of God has never really changed. 
It's always been through the Spirit. It will always be through the Spirit. Numbers chapter 22, beginning in verse 20. Numbers 22, in verse 20. The Bible says this, And God came unto Balaam at night, and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them, but yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do. Now, I want you to see God made it very explicit in the middle of the night to obey them. I, I personally believe that Balaam was saved as in the context of the Old uh, Testament, but I'll say this, he was in a mess spiritually, wasn't he? You know, that, that teaches me that I can get in a mess too, and you can too, and everybody under the sound of my voice redeemed can get in a mess. And he says, I want, if they bid you to go, go, but I want you to tell them what I had to say. You know what? Preaching will do you no good if you don't get the mind of God. The older I get, and I love studying the Word of God, I love that class we have with Brother Ken, I, lo I love to be challenged by the Word of God. But when it comes down to preaching, if I don't have the Lord God's Spirit, then I might as well sit down and, and not even try. Now, and so he had God's plan, and he chose to avoid it. You ever done that? Not just preaching, man. Every one of the gentlemen sound of my voice know the plan of God and did something else anyway. I have. Balaam wasn't the first, and I guarantee you Balaam won't be the last. He knew the will of God and chose not to follow it. That, 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 that is our nature in and of itself. Verse 22, and God's anger was kindled uh, because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Very unusual to see that wording, is it? The man of God and God being his adversary. Well, I've been there. And you know what? Probably I did just like he did and bucked against it. Now, he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of God standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field, and, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her the way, uh, to turn uh, her into the way. Now, I want you to see that Balaam's ass had more spiritual sense than he did. And was it because Balaam was lost? No, no. Balaam was a redeemed man, but he was out of the will of God, and his spiritual eyes were shut. He couldn't see it. Isn't it a shame when uh, an ass gets more in the will of God than you are? It happens, does it not? It happens. And so uh, she turned her out and wasn't want to, want to go up against the angel of God. And, and so she turned. Now notice it says uh, in verse 24, But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyard. So they went on a little way. Now they're going through uh, a great vineyard, I'm assuming. And the wall being on this side and the wall on that side. And when the ash saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself uh, into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot. Now, uh, you know what? Sometimes illness comes our way and injury comes our way to be under the glory of God. You know what? And we don't lose nothing in the translation. Uh, it crushed his foot. Now, uh, you may not know a lot about crushed bones, but I can let you see this. In that day, they were healed. They could set a bone, but crushed bones, the only way to correct them is surgery. And so, you know what? He took that with him the rest of his life. I bet he hobbled around like an old man. You know what sin will do to you to cause you to hobble around? Uh, and, and, and so we find that uh, Balaam still wasn't in any condition to submit to God's plan for his life. <laughs> he was not growing spiritual. He did not see the things of God. Verse 27, And the angel of the Lord went further. And, uh, 
<laughs> and the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either the right or the left. In other words, he couldn't even crush his foot up against the side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's ang anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with his staff. You know what a what a determined rebellion he had against God. I'm going to do it my way or the highway. Well, I'll tell you this, you keep on going in that, and you'll wish you didn't, and I guarantee you when all the water's blown, blown off, you'll do it God's way anyway. Amen. <laughs> uh, reading this on Facebook the other day, and about to sell it, he's, and he went by his neighbor's house, he said, what are you going to do? I'm going to go sell my horse. <laughs> and he said, well, you better say if the Lord wills, I'm going to sell my horse. Well, he went into trouble and got him some briars and the horse got away and he had briars all over him. And finally, at the end of the day, he went by his neighbors again. He said, well, you must have sold your horse. He said, no, I didn't sell my horse. She ran off. Now I'm going home, if the Lord willeth. <laughs> and, and, and so that's, uh, that's uh, where we ought to be. But Balaam had his plan, didn't he? Balaam thought that he was going to get the job done. And you know what? He just wasn't spiritually in tune with what God's plan was. And the Lord, verse 28, And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou smitest me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, and I would there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass, and the ass said unto Balaam, <laughs> Am I not thine ass, on whom which so was written ever since I, I was unto this day? <laughs> was I ever walked to do to do so unto thee? And he, meaning Balaam, said, Nay. Brought him back to his senses, didn't he? Yeah, that's it. He began to see, you know, this has been a good donkey up to now. I should have listened. I should have seen God's hand in this. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way and his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed and he bowed down his head and fell on his face. See, his eyes were opened up. You know what I found? Don't, for, don't try to force your agenda. That never works out. Follow the, follow the mind of God. Get in this book and desire a spiritual, uh, a spiritual recognition. Seeing the plan of God. You know what? I've seen way too many preaching men go with their own agenda, haven't you? And it, it never works out. It, it Get in the will of God and stay in it. Get in the Word of God through the Spirit and follow it what it teaches. We, we, we need to do that in the final days, do you think? Understand and know perfectly what God's will is for your life. And do it. 